Hello listeners, welcome to Sinister Obsessions. I am your host Hannah and today we are heading back to Hong Kong again for another brutal episode. You know what though, I thought I knew it all. I thought I knew all the dark stories of Hong Kong, but more and more keep popping up and this one is shocking, truly shocking considering the safety of Hong Kong. So I couldn't help myself guys but head back there again today after the milkshake murder last week. Don't forget to follow Sinister Obsessions on Instagram, YouTube, Spotify and TikTok. Please give a rating, I appreciate it so much and a cheeky download and a like. Thank you guys. Also, don't forget to check out my favorite Korean skincare brand, Skin Food. They have the delicious potato soothing pad. And these little pads can be for everyday use on the skin, all skin types for male and female, mainly on your face. These little non-bleach pads provide intensive soothing of uneven skin to help with making a bright skin tone. Completed irritation tests have been done for sensitive skin types, just like mine, especially with my rosacea that I suffer from. It also gives a very warm and soft moisturizing feeling on your skin at all times. The potato extract specifically is obtained with an extraction method that preserves nutrients of raw material and maximizes active ingredients by ripening raw material at low temperatures and then steaming it at 180 degrees Celsius and mashing with peel, which is just really fascinating. I did not know you could use foods in this way for skincare. It's pretty impressive. The little pads are also known to improve pigmentation areas and reduce skin redness after use, which genuinely works. I used to use a lot of retinol. And to be honest, guys, when I switched from retinol to all this skin food stuff, it genuinely changed and I have lost a lot of pigmentation that I used to have on my forehead from the sun damage. And anyway, along with providing a soothing care of skin scars, the little pads provide moisturizing effect throughout all seasons and any type of weather. So just a little insight there for you for the potato soothing pads. Anyway, our episode today, the Bremer Hill Murders. Two badly beaten bodies of teenage sweethearts, Kenneth McBride, aged 17, and Nicola Myers, aged 18, were found on a hillside slope in Hong Kong in April 1985. It left the city in utter shock. It was just a usual morning as any for the jogger. April time in Hong Kong is when the winter is fading and summer is approaching. Temperatures are usually pretty nice and decent, with the rainy season just around the corner. The jogger set off early to avoid any midday heat. Things were normal. Nothing was out of the ordinary until the jogger saw a couple sunbathing on the side of the hill. He assumed that the couple was sunbathing as the girl was almost naked. But when the body seemed eerily still as he approached closer, he became very suspicious and then made a more gruesome find. This is the devastating short story of what happened to Kenneth and Nicola on the 20th of April, 1985, on Braemar Hill. Kenneth McBride and Nicola Myers were a couple, and they both studied at Island School in Hong Kong. They were popular on campus. Kenneth was the president of the Students' Union, captain of the school's rowing team, and a member on his debating team. His former teacher, Chris Fort, described him as a smart student who had a strong interest in languages, and was actually hoping to become an interpreter one day. Simon Boyd, a former schoolmate of the couple, described them as very close and had a genuine and loving relationship. Also, Nicola was beautiful. She had very striking features, a stunning, attractive smile, and really beautiful hair. On the day of the attack, the couple decided to take a little stroll in the Braemar Hill countryside. This is part of the Taitam Country Park, And if you listened to my previous episode, The Milkshake Murder, I actually mentioned how the family in that episode lived in a gorgeous apartment in the Taitam area. Braemar Hill is literally next door and it's stunning. I actually used to do my own night hikes up there all the time during the years of COVID in Hong Kong. It has some really cool trails that are covered by bamboo and rocks that peek out of the trees where you can really drink in the view below of the skyline and the harbour. It's a haunting thought, actually, 
to think of such a brutal murder taking place there, where I honestly felt so safe doing solo evening treks in the dark. And I'm really glad I did not know about this murder when I was doing that because I probably would not have gone on this hike at night time knowing that one of the trails was a murder scene. Anyway, the couple spent the afternoon strolling through the countryside. Nicola's family actually lived close by at the Braemar Hill Mansions and they found a little romantic spot that was on one of the quieter pathways of the hillside. They were both studying for their A-levels. A-levels are exams we take in the British schooling system. It's our final two years of school. Both of them only had a few months left of secondary school to complete their A2 exams and then have the summer off and have fun before university. This sounds like such a cute date as well. I think it's really sweet that they had both gone off to find a nice quiet spot to study for their A-levels. I mean, it is really dreamy. Like I just explained, it's such a beautiful view. The weather would have been perfect. It just would have been really nice. It's so devastating to know and think about what happened to them. They were so innocent. They were so in love. They were just studying, you know, like really, really, really awful. Little to the couple's knowledge, they had chosen the wrong place at the wrong time. As not too far away were a group of triad members, five members, who were a little older than the couple, Pang Shun Yi, Tam Shi Foon, Chiu Wai Man, Chung Yao Hang, and Wan Sam Long, who were all between the ages of 16 and 25. Chung, who was actually abandoned by his family at the age of four, and left at an orphanage at the age of six. As a teenager, he was taken back in by his abusive father, he then dropped out of school at 14, subsequently working petty jobs in restaurants and opening ferry doors. Upon losing his job one day, he was disowned by his father and was wandering the streets where he was recruited by Pang. Wan Sam Lung was a cook at a local restaurant and the leader of the group Pang was a casual worker and a low-level member of the Fuk Yi Hing Triad Society. He was reputed as a bully and a thug. The Triad group were up to no good. And Pang, their leader, thought that, well, what else have we got to do today? Let's go up the mountain and steal a cable from the government aerial station to get some extra cash. I mean, it's completely random, but something that, yeah, is likely to happen. So this triad group, specifically a younger group, were just a group of rebellious and influenced teenagers led by mob mentality. Triad members in Hong Kong were traditional criminal organizations operating in Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and Southeast Asian countries and regions. They are kind of like the mafia or Japanese Yakuza and get involved in secret businesses such as dealing in extortion, prostitution, illegal gambling, and drug trade. I briefly covered more in detail what triads did and how their organizations ran in my very first episode, The Hello Kitty Murder. So give that one a listen, guys, because I do go into it in a lot more detail. So on one side of the hill, Nicola and Kenneth were peacefully studying for their A-levels. On the other side of the hill, the triad group attempted to steal the cable but failed several times. Then the group spotted the couple. The group decided to have some fun and thought as the couple were European, they must be rich. Pang then led the group to rob the couple. And unfortunately, Kenneth and Nicola only had one dollar on them. And they tried to defend themselves when the group started to attack them. The triad members did not believe the couple, and it turned into a vicious and fierce attack. Kenneth was savagely beaten, and his hands and feet were tied up. Tam pulled off Kenneth's Nike shoes and kept the shoes after the murder. The trainers were actually a key piece of evidence presented in court. And according to the murderer's statements, Pang verbally threatened the rest of the gang to take part in the attack. Otherwise, he would have attacked them himself. Pang then raped Nicola, while the other four members were brutally beating Kenneth. Nicola was then violently penetrated by a stick and a bottle. But the two young students did not succumb easily struggling and fighting for their lives for more than two hours. And after several attacks, Pang decided that the couple must die, as they would be able to identify them. The group left the country park after the murder and destroyed the couple's textbooks. Like, it's just so 
disturbing and heartbreaking to think that you're on a lovely date with your boyfriend, you're studying for your exams, you're in the safety of Hong Kong, your home is only really close by, and you literally get mauled by a group of teenagers. Like, it's just shocking, but I guess super unfortunate and that it can happen. It can happen to anybody at any time, safe or not. Later on that day, the couple's family realized that they were missing when they failed to return home that night. The family, obviously panicked, searched for them all night and phoned the police after failing to locate the couple. The next day, the couple's bodies, though, were discovered by the morning jogger. Kenneth was found bound, beaten and strangled with over 100 bodily injuries. Nicola's body was found half naked, her jaw broken and her left eyeball torn out of its socket. The murder clearly shocked the entire city and police mounted a thorough investigation. More than 800 policemen and several personnel from the British forces overseas Hong Kong were sent to search the site. And there's a really famous eerie photo in black and white of hundreds of policemen searching the grounds in like a trail going up the hill, which I will put on social media. Police discovered some wooden sticks that they suspected were used as weapons. Torn exercise books were also found alongside the hillside and traces of semen were found on Nicola's body, as well as partial fingerprints on the torn books and the sticks. Due to the infancy of forensic science at the time, no sufficient evidence was found to trace the murderer. The police interviewed more than 10,000 people who lived around the area, as well as known tribe members, but nothing was found. The crime shocked the community more than anything, and people were afraid to leave the house. We've also got to remember that this is kind of around the same time as the Jars Killer, the rainy night murderer, which I did an episode on in season two. Yeah, so women in Hong Kong at this point were like, fuck no, there are murderers and rapists out on the loose. This was a time, actually, I, as much as I do express how safe Hong Kong is, the triads were hot at this time and in the 90s. And although it was still safe, it was pretty scary to be a woman in Hong Kong out late at night with all of this stuff going on. Another reason why the community was so shocked was because the murder involved two Britons, which was pretty rare at the time. And a few months after the murders, an anonymous Hong Kong businessman actually donated 500,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is about 50,000 pounds, to the Royal Hong Kong Police as a reward for anyone with sufficient information about the homicide. An anonymous tribe member then eventually contacted the police, suggesting some unusual activity by one of their members. And this member was none other than Pang. A breakthrough came almost seven months after the murders, and a massive investigation into the much-publicised Braemar Hill double murder had finally caused the arrest of five young people. Pang and the rest of the group, within 48 hours, were arrested. Although they had given details of the murders, only one pleaded guilty. Pang, Tam and True were found guilty by the court and convicted later on, and they were all sentenced to death. Later commuted to life imprisonment in 1993 under permission given by the governor and council. Pang and True remain in prison to this day. Tam actually died of cancer in prison in 2009 at the age of 45. The two other killers, Chung and Won, both born in 1968, were underage at the time of the crime and were sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. After the transfer of Hong Kong in 1997 back to China, Won's parents actually appealed to the McBride and Myers families for forgiveness for Won. In 1998, the McBride and Myers families did announce that they had forgiven Won and appealed to Chief Executive Tung Chi Hua for a lesser sentence. Tung agreed and decided that Won would be incarcerated for 27 years and Chung for 35 years. Won would later say upon release in front of the press that receiving the family's forgiveness was both touching and hard to accept and that he would use the opportunity to reintegrate fully back into society. Later, Chung appealed to the court for a lesser sentence, similar to Wan's. But on the 6th of April 2006, the verdict came down denying Chung's request, 
citing that due to the heinous nature of the crime, 35 years for Chung was more than generous. In the end, Wan was released from Stanley Prison in front of the press in 2004 and was last heard of being offered clerical work in a law firm through the government's Criminal Rehabilitation Service. Interesting. In 2005, Chung's sentence was converted to a sentence of 35 years in prison and he was released in December 2007 and was last heard having been hired as an inspection worker at a public utility. And finally, to end this short episode, the aftermath. The Island School, plus family and friends of the couple, had established the Nicola Myers and Kenneth McBride Memorial Fund to support disadvantaged school kids in Hong Kong for further education, in memory of the beloved couple and their dream in helping the disadvantaged before their death. McBride's parents have since moved back to their home country of Scotland and are said to be living near Inverness. It's a really sad case, guys, but that's it for you. And to be honest, there were many, 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 many articles on this case, but not too much more information. So I wanted to do a short one this week because actually next week I will be doing a massive, heavy two-parter case. And... This one really hits close to home because actually the case I will be doing is the murder of one of my mum's best friends and it's a case that has recently come up again. So that's why I kept it short this week guys. It's been a busy time, please forgive me. But next week and the week after will be a very in detailed whopping big case with a lot of shock and a lot of information and personal details. So thank you so much, guys, for your time today. Have a good rest of your week. Bye-bye.